Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 23. It's from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Centuries after the 23rd Psalm was written, Jesus himself spoke these words. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. May God bless our hearing of this reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. <clears throat> when you look at the earliest versions of Christian art, going way back to the first, and second, and third centuries after Christ, what you see is that the image of the cross, Jesus on the cross, is really not an image for them that is as popular as it is for us. You know, when we think about the predominant Christian symbol, for us it is the cross. But in those first five centuries of Christianity, it was not like that. For the first five centuries of Christianity, the dominant and most frequently uh, painted image is that of the Good Shepherd. That's what we see in the archaeological ruins. And the image of Jesus that we are accustomed to seeing, kind of there in the back of the church, there's a picture of Jesus with long hair and a beard, right? Um, that's not the way these earliest images of Jesus were portrayed. He had short hair and no beard. Uh, and um, I'd like to take a look at some of these images. Um, these images take us to the catacombs of Priscilla, deep underground in Rome. And you can see in these catacombs, you see these things, they look like drawers, little alcoves here. This is where the early Christians would bury their dead uh, in the first centuries. Um, the bones of the martyrs uh, and of, of other Christians who had died were, were buried in these, in these alcoves. Um, in these uh, uh, catacombs. Now, it is there in the catacombs of Priscilla that you see this image, and this is looking up at a, uh, like a domed, vaulted ceiling. Uh, and this is a fresco. You can kind of see this is dirt over here uh, where the, the fresco had collapsed. And if you look right down in here, you see a skull, um, uh, uh, several skulls that are tucked away here. This is where they buried the dead, and the bones of the early Christians are still uh, buried there to this day. Um, and here is an image 
at the very top of this alcove of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. This goes back to about the year 200 uh, AD, 200 AD. So this is a very old image of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. There are sheep here beside him, and, and he's, he's protecting this lamb. Here's another image also in the catacombs of Priscilla. Uh, this is a clearer image. And again, you see, you know, Jesus with uh, short hair, no beard, uh, and he's taking good care of the sheep, the good shepherd. This is another one in uh, another uh, catacomb. Uh, this one, the catacombs of Velazio, again under Rome. Uh, and again, Jesus, the good shepherd, safely leading and caring for his flock. There are many metaphors of God in the scriptures. We hear about God as king, God as Lord. God as Yahweh Sabaoth, meaning the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. But we also hear in the 23rd Psalm the image of God as our good shepherd. And in John chapter 10, Jesus himself says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I laid down my life for the sheep. These archaeological ruins show us that long before the cross became the dominant image for Christians, the good shepherd was the image that was used, and especially used in places of the burial of the dead, a place of sadness, mourning, loss, weeping. The image of the good shepherd safely leading and guiding the sheep was one that brought those early Christians comfort and brings me comfort as well. And I like the image of the Good Shepherd for children. And I'm especially glad that we had so many children here today to look at those images of the Good Shepherd and, and tell us how they felt when they saw those images. You know, the cross is a very difficult image for children. It's hard enough for adults to comprehend the significance of the cross. But for children especially, you know, the cross, when we think about it, is, a, is an image of torture, pain, bloodshed, of death. It's an ex instrument of execution. Uh, it's a scary image for children. And I remember myself as a child in church uh, seeing the image of the cross and feeling kind of creeped out by it, you know, uh, and, and, and looking at, at, at that body up on the cross and I, and I swore I, I saw it move sometimes, you know. And, and I wondered, are they going to do that to me if I, if I misbehave? Will someone do that to my family at some point? The cross was a very frightening image, and, and it continues to be a frightening image for children. The cross obviously is central to our faith as Christians, but perhaps not the best way to present to children the love of God. The Good Shepherd, on the other hand, is a beautiful image that children can understand, that children can relate to. This is an image of, of Jesus who takes care of the sheep, who embraces the sheep, who holds them lovingly in his arms. These images of the Good Shepherd help children to understand that God is the one who provides us with safety and protection and, and, and nourishment and compassion and, above all, love and care. This is the way God relates to us. This is how we should feel in the loving embrace of our God. The paintings that we looked at in the children's sermon show how the Good Shepherd holds the sheep closely and lovingly in his arms. And so it was with these images in mind that some years ago I made a retreat. Now I know there are lots of different kinds of retreats that we've made at different times. Some of them can get kind of loud with lots of song. But my best idea of a retreat is to spend a week in total silence. So I went off to a shepherding community near Corning, New York, um, a uh, Benedictine monastery there with a group of Benedictine monks who live a vow of silence. So they'll spend all day, all week, all year after year in silence and in prayer, speaking only when it's absolutely necessary to get their job done. I mean, they're not 
crazy about it. I mean, they're not going to completely have a breakdown if suddenly they say a word, you know. <laughs> I mean, they'll, they'll speak to welcome a guest and, and help us to find our rooms, etc. cetera. But, uh, and, and they speak to pray. Other than that, it's just total silence. And this is a community that took care of sheep. And um, I learned a lot from sheep. I think the, 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 the most memorable thing that I learned about sheep is how badly they smelled. Uh, <laughs> man, sheep can stink, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, they were actually kind of gross. Uh, and, and I was surprised by this. I went expecting to see this. This is probably what Peggy's sheep looked like. Uh, I went expecting to see this. But in reality, what I saw was this. Um, their fleece was not white as snow. Uh, there were clumps of unmentionable things hanging from their backsides, right? Uh, and uh, around the head of each of them, a little galaxy of insects kind of swirled around. Uh, and uh, Peggy, did your sheep ever look like that? No. All right. <laughs> All right, well, good to know. Um, she was a good shepherd, uh, and Harry was too, I'm sure. And then suddenly I realized as I observed these sheep that these artists that drew these concepts of sheep, they were probably city kids like me, you know, <laughs> who had a good idea of what they wanted sheep to look like and what they thought sheep should look like, uh, but that, uh, you know, these things, I, I mean, Jesus wouldn't, hug one of those unless it was dipped in uh, woolite or something, you know, I mean. <laughs> so I learned a lot from the sheep, but I think I learned more from the shepherds than I did from the sheep themselves. Because I guess, you know, I picture Jesus cuddling and snuggling with these sheep because after all, who wouldn't want to snuggle with something that was so beautiful and adorable, you know? But perhaps, you know, when I saw these shepherds and the way that they did care for these sheep, they weren't caring for them because they were so adorable. They were caring for them because they were their own. And that maybe Jesus embraces and cares for the sheep of his flock, not because we are spotless lambs whose fleece is white as snow, but because we are his. We are his beloved, and he cares for us. We may not be spotless clean, but to a good shepherd, that is not what matters. In our Bible study this morning, in the adult Bible study, uh, Jim Schilling was leading us in a discussion about Peter and Peter's betrayal of Jesus. And I think Peter is a good example. This first of disciples, uh, I mean, when it came time to stand up for his faith, when Jesus was on trial, and, and, and a little girl by a campfire asked him, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? And he didn't have the courage to stand up and say, yes, I am one of his disciples. He denied Jesus three times before a little servant girl at a campfire. And Luke tells us that he was even within earshot that Jesus looked at Peter as he denied him. And you can just imagine the feelings that were exchanged in that glance and how Peter must have felt now in the gospel according to John chapter 21. And remember, we heard from John chapter 10 today in which Jesus speaks about the good shepherd. But in John chapter 21, we've got Jesus encountering Peter now for the first time. On Monday, Thursday, there wasn't much of a difference between Judas and Peter. We always think of Judas as the one who uh, betrayed Jesus, and we don't think well of Judas, but we do think well of Peter. At that moment, there was not much of a difference. They had both betrayed Jesus. What was the difference? A difference happens in John chapter 21. Now, after the resurrection, Jesus uh, tells Peter, throw the net to the other side. He pulls in this miraculous catch of fish. Peter recognizes instantly that this is Jesus. He swims to shore, and there they are standing on the shore of Lake Galilee, cooking a fish. 
And you can just imagine what must have been going through Peter's head at that moment. Perhaps Jesus was going to yell at him. I saw you deny me. Don't you remember that I said, whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly Father. Maybe he was going to yell at Peter and say once again, as he said before, get behind me, Satan. But no, Jesus simply looks at Peter and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times the same question. Not because Jesus was hard of hearing after the crucifixion, you know, but because three times Peter had denied Jesus. And now three times Jesus gives him the opportunity to get back on his feet and reaffirm his love. And each time Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus responds simply saying, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Just as Jesus, the good shepherd, embraces Peter, even with the filth of his matted fleece, he asks Peter here to do the same. Feed my sheep. Care for my sheep. And even as I have loved you with all of your filth and imperfections, even as I know that you have denied me and betrayed me, and yet still I love you as a shepherd, I challenge you, I call you, Peter, to tend my sheep, to feed my sheep and take good care of them. So it seems to me, let's get rid of that, okay? There we go. That Christ the Good Shepherd challenges us in a couple of different ways. First of all, God doesn't expect you to have sheep as white as, uh, to have fleece as white as snow. Jesus cares for the sheep no matter how stinky they are, no matter how offensive. Jesus embraced Peter and Jesus embraces you as well. Not because we're sweet and clean and snuggly and beautiful, but because we are his. And Christ the Good Shepherd calls Peter as he calls us to feed his sheep as well. And this is the second point. Jesus calls us to care for his flock even as he has cared for us. Because I think for most of us, we can think of some people who are pretty stinky sheep too, right? I can think of a few. I'm not going to name names. Uh, but for those who follow Christ the Good Shepherd, there is no one at the office who is such a jerk who is unworthy of our attention or compassion. There was no one at school who is so uncool that we can't be with them or Befriend them on the playground or at school. Can we follow the way of the good shepherd, even with his stinky sheep, even with those whose points of view or political points of view or other points of view may be so different from ours? Is there someone perhaps in your family or someone in this church who has done something that you find so offensive, so troublesome, that you feel like you just can't get close to them again? Can we follow the way of the good shepherd even with, with them, with these stinky sheep, if you will? This is what Jesus asks Peter to do. This is what Jesus asks us to do. Here's a good practical exercise in a way that we can put our faith into practice. I want you to think of someone that you find so offensive, so difficult to love. And come on, let's be honest. We all, we all have such people in our lives. And try to imagine what Jesus sees in that person, okay? Now, a facile, sarcastic answer might be to say, oh, I know what Jesus sees in that person. Jesus sees a big jerk. That's, I mean, just like I do, right? Well, it's obvious. <laughs> but really, um, what is it that Jesus sees and loves in that person? Does Jesus merely see a stinky sheep? Or would Jesus see a wounded soul? who is just as needy of healing, love, and compassion and forgiveness as any one of us. Or well, the same concept from another angle, could we pray for our enemies and let that prayer not be, Lord, change them, let them be different from what they are, but rather let that prayer be, Lord, change me and help me to love them and to see them even as you do. On that silent retreat, I also observed how the shepherd called the sheep. He walked over to the gate and the shepherd went, Wee, 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 like that. <laughs> and as soon as he did that, all of the sheep perked up their heads and they all went marching over to the gate and out they went following the shepherd. 
Now, weird things start to happen to you when you've been in silence for a, a whole week, okay? <laughs> and uh, so the next day, I'm out there at the gate and I'm kind of looking around. There's nobody there, okay? Making sure that the shepherd's not anywhere to be found. And I thought, I'm just going to give this a try. I go, wee, 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 wee. And the sheep just looked at me like. <laughs> it's like, okay, man, I get it. All right, I'm sorry, man. I was not the good shepherd, and they would not listen to my voice. And it made me think that, in fact, they did know the voice of the good shepherd. And it made me think of John chapter 10, verse 4. When he has brought out all of his own sheep, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And they will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him. They didn't exactly run. They just ignored me. And because they do not know the voice of strangers. You know, as God's flock, we will hear a lot of different voices calling us in a lot of different directions. The voices of materialism or revenge or violence or selfish grasps for power. Voices of division and addiction and uh, self-destruction. But as the sheep of God's flock, we hear the voice of the good shepherd. We listen to the voice of the good shepherd. We recognize the voice of the good shepherd because it is compassion and love. It is peaceful, it is gentle, and it leads our spirit to still waters. So let us recognize, brothers and sisters, the voice of the Good Shepherd, and let us walk in the paths where he leads us, and may we care for God's sheep, even as God cares for us.